Hello and welcome to Open Your Mind Radio. You have myself, Alan James, and we have no Stephen George. Steve is away uh, on a holiday at the moment. Well, away on a barbecue weekend, and uh, he'll be back during the week. But uh, So he's taking a little bit of a break. So you have myself only um, here going through the show and doing my bits and pieces now. My son is actually going to be on the chat room just uh, l- looking at the... Uh, if you have any questions, he's going to be cutting and pasting any questions. So if you all behave yourself in the chat room, please, that'd be much appreciated. He's young and he's uh, incorrigible. So, <laughs> so take it easy on the chat room there. Right, OK, on the show tonight, we have a ch- chap called David Boyne, Dubois. And Dave's going to be talking to us about climate change and the things that are actually going on globally. We're seeing an awful lot of changes take place at the moment and we can't, a lot of people are seeing different things but we can't seem to piece it together. So what Dave is going to do is going to help us do that. He's going to get all that information and all the things that are going on and we put it into one show. So it'll help people understand what's going on. We also have a chap coming on around half eight called Barry Fitzgerald. And Barry is um, a chap. He's going to be on the Basis Conference. And he's going to be doing a, a chat down there. Um, so he's going to be coming on telling us all about what uh, he's going to be doing, what he's going to be talking about at the conference. So, um, But before we go any further, as normal what we say, let's find out what the communication channels are. The communication channels are email info at oymireland.com by phone 046 927 and you can also contact us direct through the OYM chat room. There you go, the communication channels. Now, Steve normally rattles all these off. He knows all that stuff there. We are on Twitter. We are on YouTube. And our website is oimradio.com. And our podcasts are up there as well. Um, as I say, if you have a question, make sure you put it on the chat room, either in PIR Radio or OIM. We won't be monitoring anything else. No emails or anything like that. Because um, Steve's not here tonight anyway. So, um, so if you have any questions, as I say, in the chat room now, as usual, we have a few things to go through before we actually get a guest on. Uh, the one thing, I'm sure you've all, all seen what, what happened, I heard what happened. Jim Mars passed away in a sleep during the week. And as long-time listeners know, Jim has been on the show a couple of times. He's a great guy, great information he put out there. And it was great having him on the show. He's one of the troopers in the alternative media who really put a lot of information out there. And he's going to be sadly missed. So um, we send the condolences to Jim's family. Um, and uh, sorry to hear that he's passed over. Um, but he's in a much better place, as we all know. Now... The other thing, number two on the list, normally we're passing over between myself and Steve, so I'll be doing all the the reading tonight. The Irish government are proposing on taking 33% of your home if you sell it. Not happy with screwing screwing us for property tax, they want a big wad of cash from us as well. Now apparently this was put out in the media um, during the week, the 33%, and somebody said to me, well you know what normally happens, they put out the 33% and then they'll actually bring it down to 10%. And I'm sure somewhere in the government, there's a whole group of people sitting around a table trying to find the best way to screw us. Because if you think about it, we have mass unemployment in Ireland at the moment. And which means that people are not working and are not paying taxes. So the government are short on revenue. So they're looking for more and more ways to try and screw us. And this is just another suggestion. And this is what they do. And to be honest with you, I think we really need to protest about this because it's just ridiculous uh, what's going on if they're planning to do that. So um, just to let you know, look it up, check it out on Google there. But there, there was a proposal during the week that they want to do that. Um, so they screw you with capital gains tax and inheritance tax. And now they're going to tax you when you sell your house as well. I mean... Is it worthwhile owning a house, really, with all this tax that they're charging us? It's a bit mad anyway. Okay, and just a quick announcement on a training course for Richard Cumbers, uh, the pain genie. The Level 2 course is at the same venue on the 20th and 21st of October 2017. The non-surgical facelift workshop will be on the 22nd at the same venue. Please note that it is a prerequisite to that you have attended the Level 1 pain genie training course which I've done and Steve done. I have to recommend the course. It's very good. It changes all the time as well. Some great information on that. And the training course is in the Birmingham Buddha Centre. 
And you can call Richard on 07833 718 635 for a discount if places are available or paintgenie.com for more information. And uh, don't forget, if you are going, make sure you mention OAM Radio. Richard might throw in a little bit of a discount there as well. Now, normally we say, um, um, how's your week, Steve? Um, but as Steve's not here, I'll be just telling you about my week before we bring the guest in. We'll be bringing David in in a few minutes. Now, um, we just want to make an um, announcement that the lady who does our voiceovers, normally Steve says, and from Mary, and but her real name, as we've told you before, is Stephanie. And unfortunately, Stephanie's mother passed away on Saturday. Um, actually, was it on Saturday? No, Sunday. Sunday. No, Saturday. Sorry. Get me days mixed up. Saturday. And um, she just happened to be over with me on Friday. And we were chatting about um, maybe the different things that we could help her mom. Her mom was 75 and she had a number of illnesses. And um, But it was just kind of too late. So we send our condolences to um, Steph and her family. We even rang Bernadette Bowen just to have a chat with Bernadette, just to get her take on things. You know, Bernadette um, had breast cancer twice, and she now talks about juicing and healing and all that kind of stuff. And the one thing she did say, and I, I'd suggest checking this out. Now, it's a very expensive item. But she talked about a blanket called a Beamer blanket, and it's based on rife uh, technology frequencies. And apparently in Germany, they use this blanket to for premature babies when they're born. That's how trusting they are, this blanket, and how beneficial it is. Now, it's something like four grand to buy. I know that's very expensive and people don't have that money. Um, but the idea is, is that you lie in it for eight minutes and you build up your your system so you can actually get to the stage where you can lie in it overnight and Bernadette did buy one and she said that she had a just a couple of little like age issues that she uh, she had and she said that they then sorted themselves out by her um, in this blanket wrapping herself in this blanket or lying in this blanket for eight minutes at a time so it's called the Beamer blanket. Now I don't much I don't know much about it. Just what Bernadette said. So it might be an idea for people check it out and see what you think. Imagine if we we had a collective where we all chipped in and bought the blanket, and then everybody could come along, and if you wanted eight minutes of healing on the blanket, you could do it. Um, something like that, like a collective or a co-op or something. That would be pretty good if we could do something like that. But um, um, so that was interesting. Now also during the week again. You know I'm a big fan of time banking and bartering. And this week has been uh, no exception. Um, we, I was hooking up with two more people um, to do some bartering, uh, which we've done, um, swapping skills and stuff like that. And it's a great way to um, save money, especially if you don't have it, and swap skills. Uh, because there, will, there might be a stage when the, there is a financial collapse and there won't be any money around. So being able to barter and be able to swap any skills, skills that you have um, would be uh, it's going to be beneficial. So just a just an idea. But again, thanks to the people who actually I'm doing bartering with. They you know who you are, um, and um, they're great people. Now the guest on the show tonight is a chap called David Dubois, and David is familiar with climate change and what's going on. And so I have his bio here, and it says uh, David created the Adapt 2030 Mini Ice Age 2017 to 2035 series on YouTube and the podcast series Mini Ice Age Conversation while acting as a coffee buyer in Maymar's central Shane state and notice cold weather losses to new plantings, top leaf kill from frost and bean density decrease from below normal temperatures which ran contrary to the CO2 global warming model. Prior to that he was a co-founder of DAO Energy, an algae biodiesel company in China. Uh, David has different versions of why the Earth's climate is shifting that differs from the CO2 global warming model. His YouTube channel Adapt2030 highlights a 400-year cycle in the sun's output, which will drop global temperatures 1.5, 3.0 C over the next decade, thereby disrupting global agribusiness, which will affect everyone on the planet because we all eat every day. Um, yeah. Exactly. Um, well, David, good evening. How are you? 
Great. Thanks for having me on. I know we wanted to talk about a lot of things tonight, and I just wanted to say to the beginning, when we come out of this show at the end of the night, I want you to have a clear blueprint of the future as well as the opportunities that are all around us during this time of transition. Well, definitely. We always try and focus on, we, we, you know, we, we have a few uh, bad news for people regarding the climate, but we also try and include the good news as well and things that people can do in a positive way. Before we crack on with talking about climate change and the things going on, David, is there anything else you want to add to your bio? So the reason I got into the entire debate here was I did ask, act as a coffee buyer down in Myanmar in Shan State. Now, Myanmar, when you think about Southeast Asia, that's a tropical climate. You don't normally think of freeze damage and this type of climate in places that are 20 degrees north latitude. So when I started to see this firsthand, I had a few questions myself because I'd, I'd grown up the entire remainder of my life thinking global warming, been fed global warming, Al Gore's global warming, and then something just didn't click when I was buying coffee. And that's what led me into this entire series of videos that I do. I try to talk with people much better than myself. I continually learn, and then I present the information that, I'm, that I do find about the reasons that we're going into this new climate. And it is going to be cooling, not warming. But when we look at the effects there are some of the same effects that they've claimed global warming over these last few years, like more intense storms, heavier rain, more intense hail. These are all from galactic cosmic rays, not from CO2. Okay, the, I just have to let the listeners know that there is a bit, of a, a little bit of a delay on Skype because you're in Taiwan and there's a little bit of delay, so we just have to allow for that. Um, okay, so give us an update, David. People are seeing at the moment in Europe the temperatures are going sky high um, and there's, there's loads of fires happening and everything else we're not getting it in Ireland and the UK funny enough but we're, we're getting it in Europe um, what's going on there why are the temperatures so high because patterns are locked in place just yesterday in Colorado it's snowing in the United States up in Canada it's snowing right now but over in places like Europe it's a it's an oven we get these things called blocking patterns and they lock in place and they don't allow regular circulation in the atmosphere. And this is the reason that's all this is happening. Now, the conventional model of global warming from CO2 would say that that's because we're putting different gases in the atmosphere and then that's causing ocean evaporation. But what if there's another explanation that is non-controllable? And that would be from our sun affecting our planet. Now, if you're a government and you're going to try to control people and have them continue to go about their daily lives, if you tell people, okay, we're about to repeat a 400-year cycle and there are going to be food shortages across the planet. We're not going to be able to grow food the way we traditionally do. We're going to have to morph our food growing and agricultural systems. This is an opportunity, by the way. We're going to have to bring a lot of stuff indoor. We're going to have to shift our climate zones where we grow our crops. So just as an example, 45 degrees north latitude, anything above that line is going to be lost by, say, 2023 or 2022. It's going to actually be what you're talking about here with these locking patterns. They're going to start locking in cold or drought or too much wet, which we've seen everywhere this year. The listeners out there, have you noticed more floods in your local area or more drought? Those are part of these patterns that are locked in place, and they are very different these last couple of years. And what about the, the Gulf Stream, David? Apparently that's been affected as well. Yeah, I haven't really looked into that so much, but I have been delving into it with the help of others. It does seem that this over the 400-year pattern, it comes around cyclical that that affects a lot of the weather in Europe, this more fresh water that's coming off. And agreed, Greenland was melting. I will agree with that. But this last year, they've had record cold temperatures in the amount of ice and snow gain. This is even through the DMI. That's the Danish Meteorological Institute, has shown record ice gains and record snow for two years in a row now. So it seems like this hailing disruption that's going on, this thermohaline disruption when the warmer 
uh, water is disrupted by the cooler water, it stops the circulation pattern. This happened in the Maunder Minimum also in the 1640s, and it plunged Europe into literally an ice basket at that time. Glaciers advanced and crops just had a difficult time growing. So we have these uh, proponents of the global warming and pushing this, but we had uh, Piers Corbin on the show um, a couple of years ago, and Piers came on and said, look, we're going into a mini ice age. That's just what's happening. And this global warming, you know, carbon tax and all that kind of stuff, it's just a rouge probably to get more tax off people. Um, now, we are seeing the weather patterns were in Ireland at the moment. And we, I just happened to say it to my partner earlier on, and we've all, we always kind of say this. Years ago, when I was young, we had a summer. You know, guaranteed summer would come, you'd have six weeks of sunshine and near enough good weather, and then it would change and then go back to normal. Now, this is August. We should be basking in the sun. Steve should be outside having his barbecue and his burgers. And, well, I won't say burgers, it's vegetarian. Maybe vegetarian burgers. And um, he should be out there enjoying himself. But the weather is terrible. And uh, the summer is just, you can't do anything with bad weather anyway. So something's changing. Something is changing the weather patterns in a way that it's, you know, affecting. Um, and we've heard about crops dying as well. You know, obviously the weather patterns, the farmers rely on the, the, the good weather. And if they don't get that, the crops are going to die. So it's all happening. I can attribute that to galactic cosmic rays. So let's look at two different theories that are out there. The first one is so much CO2 and it's warming the oceans and the oceans are evaporating and they're putting more clouds into the atmosphere and that in turn is causing this rainfall you're talking about. Or we have another theory that's out there being proven, galactic cosmic rays. CERN is also showing that the increase in galactic cosmic rays induces cloud cover on our planet generally between 15,000 and 18,500 feet. And Heinrich Svensmark, also the pioneer of this study field, also shows the same. Now, when our sun starts to get into a weaker state, a grand solar minimum, the amount of cosmic rays that are bombarding our atmosphere increases because our magnetosphere, our shields are also, they go lockstep with what's happening on the sun. Do you think we sit so close to the sun that we're not electrically and magnetically connected to that largest thing in our solar system? What's going to happen is the galactic cosmic rays are going to increase 19% more over the next few years, specifically through solar cycle 25. Now, these galactic cosmic rays are responsible for more cloud cover. Global warmingists would have you believe it's from ocean evaporation, but the real truth is happening, galactic cosmic rays. And these are going to continue to increase in the size of the hail and these atmospheric compression events that you've seen where a cloud will actually ring out and such a deluge coming out that it puts three feet or a meter of water over a selected spot in a matter of minutes. Well, now, these are small in comparison to what's going to come when this cloud cover increases and then we get into the albedo effect. More cloud cover bounces off more sunlight, and it gets into this feedback loop all based on cosmic rays. But when the sun goes after this grand solar minimum, when the sun starts to strengthen itself again, the galactic cosmic rays are repelled, and then everything comes out of the atmosphere, and we repeat weather like we've just had. We've just had the highest solar activity we've had in the last 3,000 years through the 1980s and the 1990s. Now we're dropping off a cliff. We're going to go right into this grand solar minimum. Well, the one thing I want, you said an awful lot there, and I just want to pick you up on a couple of things. Uh, number one, people have been reporting higher levels of UVC from the sun, which are dangerous. That's the radiation that's dangerous for us. And I've seen a chap with a UVC meter out checking the levels and it was way high um, is that something got to do with what's going on it absolutely is and you'll also see an increase in the uvb radiation so a lot of times what's happening when you hear about these insect die-offs or insects disappearing around an area you know they their eyes pick up a different spectral wavelength when they look and view so imagine if the light changes literally from a UV spectrum, they're going to start seeing differently, be affected differently. So imagine if I put an airplane landing light in your eyes, how would that affect you? Would you go out at the same time of the day? Mm. Would you change your habit, habits or patterns? Of course you would. This is the same thing with these UV concentrations increasing. 
and they shall increase and get more intense over the next, say, four to five years. And then it should level out and stabilize when we reach that bottom point at 2023 or 2024. Yeah, the um, and there's also the the weather patterns that are changing. Some countries are experiencing when they really get snow and blizzards, the the uh, the the ice balls that come from the clouds. I mean, you're talking they're smashing car windows and uh, windows in general. They're huge. They're like golf balls. And you just mentioned that earlier on. You're saying the that this is happening. And the size of the hail that you're seeing right now is not large in comparison to what's going to come as we get bombarded with 20% increase in galactic cosmic rays. It's going to be the hail size is going to double or triple from what you've seen today. And these, the insurance companies are really having a difficult time moving forward with this as well with coverage. We can talk about earthquakes and volcanism related to these magnetic effects from the sun as well i mean it all that's why insurance companies are really having a difficult they don't know how to insure now because of this new uh, this new pattern emerging yeah the uh, hailstones yeah um that's a bit worrying uh, i did see uh, a lot of footage on um hailstones you know when the the weather was bad in various countries i think it was over actually near uh, china japan and um i mean you're talking about these massive hailstones that are coming down and they're causing severe damage. Now, I don't, where, I don't know where we stand regarding insurance because they always say, oh, it's an act of God. But, I mean, you know, I don't know where we'd stand. Like, if them hailstones happened in Ireland and uh, all our cars got damaged, you know, our property get, got damaged because they're, they're quite heavy. They could go through roof tiles easily. Um, I'm not even sure whether we'd be insured because the insurance company would just say, well, that's an act of God. There's nothing we can do. Well, when we start to look back at historical patterns as well, you start to see the same repeats that they talked about. All you have to do is look through. Let's start back in the Kofun era. This is about, say, 535 A.D. The records were really good at that time, kept with uh, how the shoguns – we're talking about Japan since you mentioned Japan, and we'll talk about the Chinese dynasties as well. They have really meticulous written records from, say, 1,500 years ago forward compared to the last 3,000 years. They were sketchy, but they're still there. Uh, they talk about these same types of weather anomalies coming on, either a 200-year pattern, which may, matches John Casey's 206-year relational cycle, or the 400-year pattern, which seems to be an overlap of intensity on these two cycles. But you see the same thing in history repeating right now. That's it. It's just a a cycle that's repeating in nature. It's been here before. It's it's going to come again. And it's looping. Okay, we have a question in from a chat room, Shane. And he said, uh, can you ask David if he believes that the globalists are using HARP as a weather weapon? Now, that's into a gray area, if you will. And I'm not sure if you, you know, HARP, everybody knows the Alaska facility. But the U.S. military gave that up a while ago, and now it's on the University of Alaska owns it. And you can actually rent that thing out and do your own experiments if you're vetted. But if we're looking at that type, who's, you know, and then we get to that gray area. Okay, well, they gave up one of the main facilities that this whole uh, debate about HARP with the ionization of the atmosphere. Jim Lee is a great person to listen to about this particular subject. They've gone in with these IS, um, with these different types of Heaters, they're actually on platforms now. They've moved away from the land-based stations into these ionospheric heaters uh, moving. But I can't really say specifically the heart facilities you're talking about compared to what they have progressed to in, say, 2.0 or 3.0 version. So that's where the gray area lies. So I can't really answer that question, but I know what he's talking about, but I just don't have the answer. Okay. Well, we're going to have to talk about chemtrails because – We've mentioned that on the show a good few times, you know, aluminum, barium, strontium, and the causes, uh, the things that that's causing. I mean, it's blocking out the sun, and you don't get that blue sky anymore. You get that hazy kind of, uh, a hazy blue color in the sky. And uh, and people are, you know, reporting certain diseases and Morgellons and stuff like that. They're obviously doing chemtrailing. I mean, we, we know that. We can see it. It's something that we can see. And um, it's not... Uh, it's not contrails, definitely not contrails. What's your take on the chemtrails? What do you think they're doing? Because if they know that this climate change is, things are changing, they must be doing this for something with the chemtrails. 
Well, this is my own personal opinion, though, when I go into this. So you can either agree or disagree with what my statement is. I personally believe it is for cosmic radiation management. Now, this would be another layer in the onion on top of the geoengineering that's there. So, again, let's think about a government body. And you're telling the citizens on this planet, okay, we're, we're going to put up geoengineering programs to try to stop global warming. That gives us sort of the power to take it back. If you stop driving the car, if we close this coal-burning power plant, we can do something. Yay. Or I can tell the citizenry, we're on a 400-year cycle, and we are trying our very best to stop massive crop wipeouts. We're going we're to actually put these nanometals in the sky for cosmic radiation management, and it's just going to get worse from this point forward. But keep going to work and pe- keep paying your bills and keep paying your taxes, okay? What, what, do you, what would you do? It's your, w- that's my opinion. We are in cosmic radiation management at this moment. Well, I, I would agree with you on there. It's a question that I ask. Uh, I've asked a few people, and I said, if you were, at the time it was Obama, you could say Trump if you want, or whoever, pick a uh, president or a prime minister. And um, if, you are, if you were one of them, and you were told by your experts that, by the way, it's, a, it's going to be like 2012, you know, we're going to have this, uh, major apocalyptic weather uh, patterns coming in and it's going to be affecting the earth and there's nothing you can do about it uh, would you tell the people yes or no and the most people I've I've asked that question to they've all said no they said what's the point um, and I suppose it's, so it's a question for everybody listening to the show you know if you were in that situation and you were told this information what would you say would you tell the people and cause because he would cause mass panic with people. Everybody would stop work. They wouldn't be going to work. And the wheels of industry would just stop. And there'd be a, you know, they'd have, have to bring in curfews and martial law and everything else. And, you know, why would you tell people that? So what would, uh, what do you, what would you say to that? If I ask you that question. No, I'll, I'll continue to answer that. Because I think that is a question that we really, really need to talk about. Because going forward with this mass panic I think people would come together and say, okay, we have a serious issue going on. People have survived this through the last five, six, eight, ten, hundred of these things. They come on a a cyclical pattern. We have better technology now. We have better trade routes. We have better communication. I think people are even more informed now that they would make more informed decisions. And I think that if we all came together, it would change the way the economy flows Now, if you go into the panic part here, everybody's going to pull their money out of the bank at the same time or cash in their retirement funds or IRAs just so they can get the funds to go to buy the seeds or the tools or the water filters or the long-term food storage. And that would just absolutely disrupt the economy in a single less than two-week period. We'd be into mass chaos just economically if they did that. But if the governments were really coming out and they really said, all right, we need to work together. We have all these options. We can we can get it together. I think people would choose getting it together versus the mass panic thing. But the governments are not giving us any more time. We're really out of time. The these the largest changes coming up that are going to shock this planet are coming up between 2018 and 19 in terms of food price rises. There's going to be these mass losses due to drought, which you're talking about in Europe. Look how much food is not going to be produced in Europe because of the drought this year. And then we go down to Australia. They lost 40% of the wheat crop. And we go to the United States. They lost not only the winter wheat, but the spring wheat due to flooding in the spring. And then this out-of-season blizzard that came through and wiped out most of the Kansas wheat crop. Saskatchewan has, they were flooded out in the beginning where the farmers couldn't get into the fields. And now they're in drought, so they can't really harvest everything. And it's just going to keep getting into this feedback loop here. And mark my words, at the end of this year, when we go into harvest season, the numbers are going to come so low that it's going to shock the futures market. And you're going to look for instant price increases. But that's not the shock, really. Next year is going to be exponentially more happening than this year in terms of losses. Now, we can pull out of the silos for now, but how much longer can we pull out of the silos and how much more – can people pay for food before they stop spending on other things, the disposable income? And that's really what the economy is going to be all about. People are going to stop spending, and they're going to spend it all on food. Well, there's a couple of things that you said there which I want to pick you up on. 
Um, just as information, something we mentioned before on the show, a couple of years ago there was an article in the local newspaper over here in Ireland where the Irish government were actually doing um, a checking continuity of government, basically making sure that if anything happens that they would be covered. So just something of interest to mention there. But working together, um, I'd say, David, you're probably not familiar with the Irish government. I can't see that happening at all. I think what will happen is a group of people who know what's going on, are familiar with what's going on, will actually probably get together. We all have to get together from a community point of view. And you probably heard me mention time banking and bartering um, earlier on in the show. And that's what we'll need to do because we'll get to the stage that um, we won't, the money won't be of any value. So we'll have to use our energy to swap skills and to, I mean, Ireland's not bad. It's a good agricultural country where, where, you know, we have, okay, the climate, it's not the best. It's very, uh, it's a very wet climate, but in a way that could be a good thing as well. Um, the one thing I'd say about the mass panic with people, I know we have loads of technology out there, but we also have a lot of people reliant on the nanny state. If you were to take a group of people from a city, um, well, the example is the, the program on, and I, I urge people to look at this, National Geographic, we've talked about this before, called American Blackout. And he took um, preppers. He had one side of the coin was the preppers, and the other side was the people in the condo who didn't have a clue about anything. And they had 10 days of no power. And they gave you an, ex- an example of what would happen in them 10 days. And that was a, for me, that was a bit of an awakening on how much we rely on electricity and power. So that kind of that's why it got myself and Steve into solar generators and solar energy and to understand and try and get something up and running. Um, and I think that's important. The other movie as well that I would recommend people, we've said it before on the show, I don't know whether you've seen it, David, a Silent Green with Charlton Heston, where exactly the conditions you're talking about happen on the planet. And there's a twist in the movie, I'm not going to say what it is because... I don't want to spoil it for people who didn't see it. But it was a film that was done in 1973 and it was based on 2022, I believe. Now, that's a kind of coincidence, all right. It is. And, you know, we've gotten so reliant on provisions from companies. We all forgot to go to know how to grow our own food. I mean, my grandparents and their generation, every time we'd visit their farm, Everybody grew food around the entire community, regardless even if it was at a farm or if it was getting closer into the suburbs. Everybody had a garden. Now, this is another opportunity. I really believe that going forward, when letters of credit are not honored so much anymore because the tumultuous time in the economy as periphery businesses start to uh, go under because lack of spending, we're going to have to get back into this more self-sufficiency mode And you are not going to do that by yourself. You're going to need a community of people to work with you because you can all share tips and ideas. You know, somebody knows how to grow tomatoes and they're a professional. The person's 60, 70, 80 years old. They got way more knowledge than you do. And then you know how to do something better than them. Water filtration. You know how to raise beds. It could be anything. And we here we come back into the skills trading again. And we're going to have to be more self-sufficient. And if there's only one thing, really, if everybody listening tonight, if you can take one thing away from you, from this interview, you are going to have to learn how to grow your own food again, and you are going to have to learn to work with your community to survive through these next few years, for sure. These now, I'm not saying two years. I'm talking about a 10- to 12-year period until 2030, and then the weather should start to warm back up again into something not exactly like today, but stable-er, if we will. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Something that I'm looking at getting, and the problem where I am, because I'm kind of on what we say Walton's Mountain, the water is pumped up the mountain, and when there's a power cut, the water stops as well, which causes a problem because it's okay having a filtering system, but if there's no water, there's nothing I can do. So one of the things I'm looking at doing, and I put it on my, my Christmas list, is to get a Berkey filter. And the Berkey filter with the fluoride filters on it, you can literally put anything into it, and it'll filter the water, and it's mobile. You can pick it up and go with it. And it's around 200 euros, 250 euros, and you can get all different sizes. So 
if for people who are interested in filtering the water, um, if you have a local pump, I, I'm in a village and we have a local pump. Now, the water, according to the council, is not drinkable because there's too much lime in it and God knows what else. But at least you can pump it from the ground. If you can pump that water and put it in the Berkey filter and it filters the water and you got water, then for me, that's a start. Um, growing your own food is obviously definitely important as well. Now, there's a couple of questions come in there. We go off to the questions. Now, we have uh, Tony, Tommy N on the chat room there. And Tommy wants to know, please ask David if he has an update on radiation from Fukushima. <coughs> I do not. All I know is that ocean circulation pattern is bringing it back over to Taiwan and through the Japan archipelago about this year because it'll take a full five and a half to six years for that ocean water to circulate all the way around. So it's actually getting back to almost its start point coming this year or in the next six to eight months. That's the update I have. Okay. And is that has to be in any clean up with Fukushima at all or has it just been getting worse all that time since we've known about it absolutely getting worse uh they're trying to i guess people have just accepted it and there's no longer really protests or things going on to have anybody in the japanese government try to clean that up as such you think there would be mass protests across the entire country daily to get this thing fixed but Apparently, the, the, the rods and the core have just lodged and burnt their way literally through the earth down into the water table. And now it's affecting the water that's around that they're trying to pump up to use for Tokyo and Chiba. And then, you know, what's happening in the, the radiated water is being pushed out into the, into the sea, what's happening above ground there. It is still truly a mess. And it's more like ostriches with their heads in the sand versus really trying to take care of this. And I know just a couple weeks ago, they sacrificed another robot, underwater robot. They went down to see how deep it was into the water table. Uh, but they sacrificed another robot for that mission. But it's not stopping. It's just not. And that's another thing to consider. What happens with the food supply coming out of the oceans, specifically in the Pacific? This is not exactly – it'll ta it'll mix into the Atlantic, but it's going to take decades to do that. But so far, it's pretty much limited to the Pacific. But an enormous amount of fish comes out of here as well as seafood product. Yeah. the uh, I did see video footage of a chap on the West Coast with a Geiger counter actually checking the radiation, and it was quite high. Um, so it is beginning to affect – um, fish and uh, uh, life, uh, you know, uh, sea life um, on the west coast of America. So um, I would just be cautious if anybody lived over there, if you're tuning into the show and listening, obviously try and get yourself a small gog counter and just do a scan on any food or water you're using before you drink it, um, just in case, because you never know. Right, we have another question for you. We have a question from Joan, and Joan said, could large solar farms affect weather patterns and climate change uh, will certainly affect food security in Ireland, she believes. They would, but it would be such a small regional effect that it would literally be just affecting the city or the periphery of the clouds on the city. I mean, they do. Have you been near a solar farm? There's a lot of uh, reflective light around there that heats other places unnaturally, the reflection of the light. It's like grabbing a mirror and then in the sunlight, bending that and focusing it on a single point. Of course, you're going to heat part of the atmosphere. You're going to heat a periphery of a forest somewhere. But that's going to be so localized that I really don't believe it would have much of an effect because even the largest floating solar farms over in China are only, what, like 100 hectares? I mean, when you're thinking about 100 hectares of mirror out there, how much would that really affect the atmospheric conditions around the area? That's my own opinion, though. I mean, perhaps somebody has better knowledge. If you do, please share it with me. I'm always willing to learn. Okay, no problem. And we have a question from Martin from the PIR chat room. What does David think of Al Gore? Well, again, I, I think that Al Gore is part of this structure that is trying to control human population to get them to not panic. I believe... That whole presidency with the election at that time, I believe he lost on purpose, and that was his 
particular job after he lost because he got so much sympathy that we instantly believed him. We instantly believed him. After that election, he was stolen, he was robbed, he was cheated, and now he's the good guy because he's telling us about all this climate change and all the bad stuff that the oil burners are doing. And see, he's so good. And now he's kept that thing going and going, and we've lost time because of this message that has just been pushed. And all the opposition of that message lost their funding. Anytime you talked about global cooling or anything not related to global warming and ice melt and glacier loss and all these types of things, they lost their funding or they lost their tenureship or they were removed from the universities or the research labs. And that just hasn't stopped until maybe a couple years ago. And now things have suddenly changed. And you talk about the messages from Hollywood, and there's been this ramp up in survival shows over the last six years. And now suddenly the whole message is even NASA's talking about ice caps aren't melting, sea levels not rising, and now the solar minimums here. And these are all NASA releases in, say, the last six weeks, if you're paying attention on the net. The whole message is now shifting. So I don't know, these scientists that are coming out with alternative theories and ideas are now more not, they're not afraid to talk so much as they were during the witch hunt of the 1990s or early 2000s. If that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's fine. Now, we've kind of heard, and we don't know how true this is, but apparently, obviously Al Gore talks about global warming and the uh, the rising of the sea levels. But I'm just wondering, why would he buy uh, seaside property or, you know, sea view property if the you know water levels were going up? Makes you think, really, you know, at the end of the day. Nice and cheap, by the way, because everybody's selling to try and get away from the coast, and he's buying property at the coast, allegedly. Um, we don't have any have any confirmation of that, but a little birdie told us. Um, you know, I totally agree with you. The, and the gas, some of these people who are going around giving out about climate change, um, they're going around in their jets, their private jets, and everything else. I mean, what carbon footprint would they be putting down doing that? Oh, a couple million. I think it was 2.3 million tons for all the attendees going to the last 2016 IPCC Global Summit. I think it was 2.3 million. I'd have to look that up though. Yeah, the, that's off the top of my head. The number I remember. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I like the way they tell us the the 99 percent of the population that we need to cut back on our carbon footprint and to save money and switch off the lights and do all that kind of stuff. And they're still doing what they're doing and not changing anything. Um, the other thing that seems to be uh, doing the rounds as well, and there's a lot of talk about it, is there's a, a lot of millionaires or billionaires buying silos. Um, whether uh, obviously in South America and New Zealand and, and you know maybe they're buying them as a precautionary thing um, because they know something's going to be happening something's coming down the line and they just want the backup just in case have you heard anything on that side I have and I'll also ask the, the listeners out there do you feel something's going on right now like the world's going mad it's absolutely falling apart and it, it seems like it's not making sense because from a common sense standpoint, all these reckless spending by central banks or reckless spending by governments and these laws that are being passed with more draconian laws. And now they have military working with local police and it, things are becoming a police state and there's so much surveillance. And people can feel, absolutely feel something has changed energetically. That is the changes from the sun that are affecting you. The Schumann resonance has changed as well. It's, it, it, it reached 36 back in April, the heartbeat of the earth. It was around seven before 7.9. And now it went up to 36 and back down. So you are an electrical being. You psychologically feel things that you're not in tune with, but they're still coming in. You just can't decipher the message that's coming to you. And on the entire planet, I really, a lot of people are feeling strangeness that's around them. Of course there's something coming. This grand solar minimum is coming. It's, it's in our DNA to try to survive this thing. It has been not just once or twice. It goes back hundreds of thousands and millions of years this thing comes. But in the last 100,000 years, every two to 400 years, depending on the severity, 200 years is a light grand solar minimum. It's 1.5 C drop. And the heavier ones like the modern minimum, they're overlapping cycles and they occur every 400 years now do the mathematics on a hundred thousand year cycle how many times does that occur and then widen that out into supposedly when the human species uh, homo sapiens sapien has evolved and we got to go back now divide that by 
250,000 years, and how many times does this cycle come again? Like, we've gotten kind of used to it. Our sixth sense is telling us something is not right, and the they're buying their shelters knowing that the global economy is going to collapse because your food price is going to double or triple. And when you pull that money out, that's got to come from somebody else's spending. That would have gone into somebody else's business. Of course, food prices are going to rise. What if they get scarce in a space? What if they're scarce in some global area? This is why I think smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain specifically are going to come up and be the way we're going to move forward in cryptocurrency. When one economy collapses, the only thing that will store value and in, in sort of a, you're going to have to use digital currency. That will be the replacement for the old economy, whatever the base asset's going to be, whether it be a Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin. It could be Ethereum Classic. I don't care going out steam. could be any of them. But whatever preserves value is going to preserve value. And these elites or whatever you want to call them, I don't call them as such. I'm a sentient being on this planet. I do not believe being ruled by somebody other than my own thoughts. But anyway, that that I do see them going with their bunkers because they know something's coming up. And so does everybody else on this planet, though. That's the thing. We all feel it. Well, maybe it's uh, more so the graves on the bunkers. They might be buried down there. Um, definitely agree with you on uh, the nuttiness that's taken over the planet. There's a lot, of, a lot of, we've spoken about this on the show, that masks are coming down and personal, personalities, true personalities are coming out. Uh, with people and sometimes these personalities are not so nice and people will turn around and go that's not the person I know and um, that's definitely happening we know that the energy is coming in and hitting the planet um, from the centre of the galaxy we've heard this time and time again as you mentioned the human frequency going up as well and all this is having an effect some people are aware of it and are managing to stay grounded as much as you can that's what you'll have to do because uh, it's going to affect everybody, but people who aren't aware of it, it is causing a major problem. And there's so many things going on now, we have to be aware of this um, and be able to cope with it. And as I say, stay grounded. I think people practically are going to have to get, get around, um, get their head around growing food, growing their own food. As I say, I just mentioned to you before you we went uh, live on air there, David, I've started off experimenting with a raised bed and I have my cabbages and my string my uh, spring onions and my carrots there but um something's eaten my leaves and my my cabbage leaves so i'm gonna have to check into that because um even though they're covered something's eaten them i don't know where they, how they got in there but it's probably a green fly or something i'll have to check it anyway but um on my plan of attack is to have another two or three raised beds and and grow other things as well as well as potatoes because what what we're getting and what we're going to be getting as time goes on, they can't. That Tesco truck cannot keep turning up at you know Tesco's and throwing the food out. It's just not possible with the weather patterns changing at the moment. With as you said, the the crops, um, it's either heat, too much heat, or too much bad weather. Um, it, it's it, the derivatives market, the futures market is based a lot of this on crops. And if they go down and the derivatives market goes down, um, the, the proverbial is going to hit the fan. So people are going to have to learn to be self-sufficient and get people around them who are understand this and work together to do it. Because at the end of the day, if Tesco's closed down and them shops closed down, what are you going to do? Now, I don't want to scaremonger people, but I think knowledge is power. Um, and knowledge gives you choice. Ignorance doesn't. So if you know about it, you can choose to do something about it. And that's a good thing. So I think it's important for people to start learning, to get them skills back that they had years ago. Maybe your parents' parents um, who had them. Them skills of, of growing food and knowing how to grow food um, and, and being self-sufficient as much as we can. I think that's going to be very important. I'll agree with that. And staying on the, the theme of food, you know, let's do a history lesson. The shekel was based on 180 grains of what? Wheat. So the original money was based not on money value, but on the amount of food that the silver would get. In other words, now we've changed it around to these pieces of paper and fictitious fiat equals something that we can buy. No, no, no. Go way back. The amount of food equaled the silver. And we're going to come back into this where there's going to be regional shortages. And let's do a history lesson again. You know, you go over to China and every time there's a grand solar minimum, their emperorship changed. 
anything up in Heilongjiang and that area, 45 degrees north and up in North Korean area, that all went offline growing. And if it does the same thing, which I predict it will this time, China imports so much that where are they going to get it from? Because Canada is going to go offline and almost anything north of 45 in the United States, and that'll be the, anywhere in the Dakotas. It won't be exactly in Kansas, but they'll get in the beginning, the periphery of the cold. But most of Canada will be offline. A lot of the United States will also be offline. But then that whole Euro Mountain area growing and then all through Russia, that's all going to go offline. That's only the northern hemisphere. And then we shift down and we're starting to see this right now. Australia, 40 percent down from last year's record harvest. I'll agree. Last year they produced what was it, 2.3 million tons more than the previous year, and it was an all-time record. Great, but they just lost 15 million tons. Now where do you start to make that up? America just lost minimum 40 percent of its entire wheat crop, and they still haven't put how many uh, how many bushels are coming in per acre yet. But this is the whole reason I say we need to wait until the harvest season because the same thing happened in France and Germany their their wheat production's down nothing terrible and it's not about the amount of wheat either it's about the protein content in the wheat so even if you have wheat it's been so stressed either through flooding or through drought or through heat or through increased uv that that protein content is not the same so we have all these factors going on so 1 ton of wheat doesn't really equal a ton of wheat anymore the protein content's different so it might take 1.1 or 1.2 million tons to equal a million tons of what we previously bought, or one ton equals 1.2 tons. But we're getting into this whole feedback loop where food's going to get more expensive. It's going to go offline. There's going to be regional shortages. And those who export and those countries who rely on imports, I'm specifically going to talk about Egypt here. They rely almost exclusively on imports for their wheat. If their major producers go offline that they're bargaining in and they're out on auction right now, if they can't supply this year, where are they going to get that wheat from? And that just goes with China, too, because there's such huge importers. I'm calling regime change in China based on food prices and riots in the streets within five years in China. You see, we in Ireland, we're lucky because we are very uh, – climate is quite, as I say, is quite uh, damp. But in a way, it, and, and, and wet, but it, it, we are very uh, agricultural and we have the land. Um, and even though we have changing weather patterns, I do think that Ireland – um, is fairly safe from growing our own. Now we don't do an awful lot of it, um, but we I think we could actually do a hell of a lot more. Um, so I think from an Irish point of view, we'd be okay. And in the UK as well, I think they'd be okay. I think, as you said, more uh, southern-based co- countries like Egypt and stuff like that, who wouldn't have the climate because it's very hot, very, very, um, very dry. Can't really grow the food down there. Um, they would be struggling along with a few others. Um, but I would just say again to people to actually start just grow your own, learn how to do it. One of the great questions I see come up there um, on the chat room is um, um, the person said, I think it's Lynn on the chat room said that she has grown her, her own food, um, all different kinds of food, but she now has to learn how to store the food. So it's a whole process. It's not just learning how to grow the food, but storing the food, how long to keep it, and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, you need to have certain. You can't just um, have one food group. You have to mix it up as well. Um, so that's obviously important as well. Right, and that comes in back into the whole community because if you know how to grow that food, and then there's a person who knows how to dehydrate it and store it and turn it into long-term food storage. And if you can get that packed into one kg bags or one pound bags, whatever your weight measurement is, that's a tradable commodity at that point for the people involved in that operation. You know, some people like to raise goats. I have a few friends who like goats. They've got incredible milk. You can make yogurt. You can make cheese. But others like to grow vegetables, and and I like to do moringa, and I like to grow spirulina algae. But if I need some goat milk, I can trade them some moringa powder, and that's a fair trade in my day. Right now it is, and uh, people are willing to trade like this because not everybody wants to do the same thing. And so here's another opportunity for you. you got to do what you love. Like when we go into this more pioneering lifestyle, if you want to term it as that, where we need to be more self-sufficient, et cetera, not everybody's going to take that same road to go down to self-sufficiency. Some people love woodworking. Some people love preparations of food. Some people love growing food. Some people love animals and animal husbandry. Others love fish and fish farming. Others are terrified of the water, yet I love swimming. I'll go out and catch fish or I'll raise fish. I like that. It's all going to be a skill set 
And you're going to have to pursue what you love most because that's where you're going to find your greatest joy. And that's where you're going to really enjoy doing it and sharing with others. Because not everybody's going to want to pile in and all do goats. And not everybody's going to want to pile in and grow vegetables. It's just not like that. And of course, you so know, when you talk about skill sets again, this is kind of the everybody's got to follow their passion moving in this direction. Because nobody's going to, you know, look at all the careers that we could choose from today. But not everybody jumps into the same careers. But we do sort of now. It's been skewed because of the money factor. But let's go back 50 years. Most people did what they liked. And then they just, the money comes because you like what you do. It's your passion. So continue with it. But again, the system was designed in a way to make us reliant on the nanny state and to make our lives, well, make our lives easier. But if you look at the jobs, I mean, if anything happened, there's no point being a banker or a solicitor or a commodities broker because your skill set will be just redundant. So I would say to people, start looking at um, I say, I'm no gardener by, by the way, I'm no, I'm not into gardening, but I wanted to give this a try and see how I get on. Um, and, uh, and so far so good, it's growing, but the one thing I've, I've, I've now learned is that it takes longer than you think. If you're growing something, don't assume that's going to pop on, pop up in a few weeks. You're talking about probably two to three months. So if you're planning to feed your family, you want to make sure you have a good, um, a good bit, a little bit of land, at least in one acre or even less than that. You can probably feed a family of about four or five with about half an acre if you have a back garden and use that. Um, but the dehydrator, you can buy dehydrators. Very important. You can buy them. And when you have the food, you can dehydrate them and pack them, which is a great idea, David. Um, and that's a great reminder. I forgot to mention that. Um, you can buy dehydrators and that will store your food for a period of time. So again, these are all kind of skills that we just have lost because we kind of got lazy, got involved with the system, the nanny state and everything else. And uh, we need to get back to that. We have another question from Tommy N on the chat room. And Tommy wants to know, please ask David his views on Monsanto regarding the agri-foods. Yeah, when we come into those, the first they have the Roundup Ready GMO seeds, but how healthy is that for your body going in there? And we know the side effects of all the the Roundup Ready spraying anyway. I mean, when you're spraying Roundup across, even if you have an organic farm next door, that's going to contaminate. Air doesn't stop at your property line. Winds move. So that in itself makes me question, you know, why would they put something so poisonous out there? But then the way that the, the Terminator seeds work is you cannot harvest that next season and Monsanto went around, this is back 30, 40 years ago, and they bought up what they, they call them seed cleaners. What they would do is they had these specialized machines uh, that would come by and they would take part of 20% of your harvest. And then it would shell the seeds out so you could preserve and store those. And then you could plant those for the next year's harvest. Now, back at the time before they really had the Roundup ready, there was still a way to get around their patent by using these seed cleaners, if you will. But they bought all those companies out so nobody even had the option to get those seeds prepared to keep for next year. But by growing your own food, you can go right around that. As long as you have heirloom seeds, you can preserve and then you can keep 15 or 20 percent of your crop. And then those seeds are also going to be used as commodity as well. Those seeds, oh, my gosh, seeds are going to be so valuable. Those are literally going to be worth their weight in gold, literally. In the future, if you have real seed that's heirloom that can be regrown generation after generation, that you can take some of that after it seeds out and you can store that and preserve it to grow the next year's crop. But then talking about Sargenta, and there's been a lot of different studies done with the chemicals that are coming out of there, and I'm not going to really name them because of the lawsuits at the moment, but you can do your own research. There's amazing guys coming out of Stanford University hitting them right on the head with their uh, – with what, what they're going on and the, the effects with uh, reproduction in some of these, shall we say, fertilizers that are used on all corn crops across the United States, basically across the world. So these giant agribusinesses, they're not there to help us. They're there for a purpose to dominate the food growing industry. So it puts people like us out of business, small farmers out of business, so they can control the entire food distribution chain. And I mean vertical. From the seed production to the seed distribution to the fertilizer production, the fertilizer distribution, the machinery that's involved. 
And then every the storage of it, the movement of it, they own everything down this chain. And you are at their mercy to try to get their food out of there. And when we come into these times, when food's going to be getting more scarce and more valuable and more expensive, you are going to need to know how to supplement yourself. So the way they've dominated the food business, I understand from a business standpoint of, you know, getting the best price for your shareholders. That's all nice and everything. But the point of trying to help the planet in any way, shape, or form, that that was at a zero percent right there, not even one-tenth of one percent or one-fifth of one-eighth of a percent to help others is not in their business model at all. It's pure domination, and it's pure wipe out of any competition to con- totally control. Like if you control a nation's money, that's one thing. That's small. You control a nation's food supply, that nation is at your mercy, period. Yeah, I, I will say um, we uh, familiar. There is a, a movie out there, and um, it's called a documentary called uh, "The Corporation," and it talks about Monsanto, and it talks about um, the obviously the what Monsanto did with the suicide seed. So you buy a license for these seeds, and they only grow once, and then that's it. And then you have to buy more seeds off them. Um, and uh, and that's worrying, and that's the kind of control that Monsanto wants. So we have to um, be able to make sure we get good seeds. But also something that we were told before, that as the seeds are sent over, you have to try and get seeds that are um, from Ireland. Because if they send seeds over from uh, another country, they normally go to the airport or the customs through a scanner, and the scanner does radiation. And we were told that that could actually affect the seeds. So something to keep in mind that if you are buying seeds, try and find out where the seeds come from and are they produced in Ireland rather than abroad. Just something to consider um, because that would be a concern as well. Um, yeah, Monsanto, uh, the doc- this documentary, The Corporation, if people haven't seen it, I'm sure if you go on YouTube, you might be able to find it there. i seen it a few years ago and it was frightening what they were doing. One of the examples was that they were pumping the cows with so many, so much hormones to keep them producing milk, that there was pus coming out of the teeth of the cow, and it was going into the milk. And there was two reporters who uh, came across this story, and they wanted to put it out there, and there was a, a fax came through from Monsanto and said, if you open your mouth, we're going to sue you. Um, and that was it. They were told to shut up. They couldn't put the information out there. And this is what people need to be obviously aware of um, with the, the, when you go and buy the food. A friend of mine also said to me <coughs> that it's amazing when you go into the likes of you know, Super Value or Tesco's or any of the high street shops and you go to the veg section, you can't smell anything. But when you go into a vegetable shop, a real vegetable shop, you can smell everything. And isn't that strange? And I did want to add one point. When you're talking about those seeds that are coming in from a different country, think about the grow zones that are different. Think about the local climate, the soil, the moisture, everything that's going to be different where those seeds originated from. That's one of the things with the Indian seeds that I buy to try to grow Moringa. Those are from India. They're not from where I'm growing them at. So we get some differences in the yield. We get some differences in the sprouting times. Uh, the differences on the amount of leaf that's coming off, the oil yield off the sticks, because it's not from the same place. It's not grown in the same place. So you got to think about that as well. If you are going to trade seeds, obviously it's going to be a local area that you're in or even a, a countrywide area. But once you start shipping things continentally, which, by the way, I believe we're going to come back into more of a regional trade type of thing. I think we've gone as far as we can go with globalization. And I think from these next couple of years, it's going to start to contract back in on itself just to economic woes and all these different trade wars and things that are going to start off here. But please think about when you're planting, it's in the right grow zone because our temperatures are going to get cooler. And the periphery times that you're going to be growing, so let's say that generally after they call it like first the last frost that would come up during a springtime, You can expect a later frost than that coming up for sure in the future. So if it's, say, like May 1st, and that's generally in your area for the last 100 years that it's been, the last frost is May 1st. Well, I'm sorry. This new paradigm we're entering, your last frost is probably going to be 
May 30th, or not May 30th, but May 15th, or maybe June 1st, somewhere along that way, a two-week interval stepping up. So when we're getting into the harvest seasons as well, expect snows to start earlier and these outrageously strong wind vortices effects to destroy crops that are still in the field. Those will be stranded there. And we've seen this happen again and again and again these last two years. They've been stranding so many crops. Just, there were still a million tons of uh well, canola stuck in the fields in Canada this year just when they were trying to get planting because they couldn't get it out. It was too wet. So you start getting these feedback loops of out of season, the, pushing the late edges of the seasons, and the, we're going to enter this. This is the paradigm that's coming before you. So come at it from a an understanding of what's happening, not from fear base. And if you look back in history, just go back and study the grand solar minimums. People thrived during these times, but they just knew how to thrive because they were looking in the right direction. Well, what I'm getting from what you're saying there, more my in the back of my mind, I'm going, you know what? We, what we really need to do is start setting up the likes of polytunnels and greenhouses where we can actually control the climate as much as we can um, away from what's going on outside to have some kind of natural growing um, seasonal period for um, the fruit and veg that we want to grow. So I think that's probably where we're going to have to go. Well, the first stop would be a history book, because all you have to do is get a history book and go back to the 1640s and see what the climate was like in your area. I mean, almost every continent has historical records going back to 1640, and you can get a mimic of what's about to transpire in the next eight years if you get a history book back to 1640. So, for example, up in Ireland, in that area up there, what was happening in 1640? I know the potato famine was during the Dalton minimum. You switched crops. What happened prior to that, the previous, before the Dalton minimum, what happened during the Maunder minimum? Well, let me just say something that the whole famine thing in Ireland it's a bit controversial because there is a, a belief that it was a holocaust because it was in 1845 to 1848. And um, basically there was a lot of food taken from Ireland and shipped over to the UK. So when people say the potato famine, there wasn't a famine, it was a holocaust. It was done on purpose. If you look at the history of Ireland, but we won't go down that because that's a different subject. But the dates I've given you there, 1845 to 1848, when that was happening... Do you have any idea what was going on that time? Yeah, that was at the edge of the Dalton minimum. Mm. And I'll okay. agree with you. See what happened back then. There was plentiful food in one region, but it was stolen to feed another region. Now, you think that's not going to happen again when this comes? We're on a global scale now with larger militaries. They, they wouldn't think twice about stealing the food and leaving people starving in one country today. The lack of morals that's on this planet and the lack of just there's something that's missing right now that used to separate people that were genuine and virtuous from people who are not. And I just, there's, there's something that's split right in the middle right now. Oh, you know what? And the ones who are out on that edge will steal the food to feed their own or steal it to make a buck, and they will leave you starving, guaranteed. So, again, how are you going to come together? How would your community protect itself from the marauders? Of, what if it's government marauders that are coming up to take your food versus just a band of thieves that are trying to get around? So these other things are going to come into play as well. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things that um, John Irwin, the super soldier, said, he said, your enemy is not technically the government. It's your next door neighbor. Because if you have something and they want it, then that's where they, they that's why you need to get something together. But I do think people need to sit down and grab themselves a cup of tea or coffee or whatever. And just for a few minutes, ask themselves the question, what would I do if I could not go down next week? A message come on the television and said, next week it will be the last delivery of food to your local shops because we cannot supply it anymore. What would people do? I mean, there will be mass panic. But I'm not saying that will happen, but it has happened in other countries. And I just think the reality has to kick in for people to realise that this Tesco truck turning up every day to you know, stock the shelves, it can't carry on. It can't carry on because the world is changing and we're, we're depleting, you know, the Amazon, we're cutting down the Amazon, the lungs of the earth, as they say, we're cutting them down. And there was a program done all about the whole um, 
um, system the way it's all you know they they cut down the trees and it goes in the factory and it comes out as a an iPod or something and then the whole process starts again consumerism and the whole that can't carry on because it's finite because there's only a, a finite amount of land on the planet that you can do that too and we'll have major effects on the planet so we need to um and people need to sit down either on their own or in a group who are open-minded and go well what are we going to do if this happens because if you're saying i mean you're you, you said to me there before the show david that this could be start happening as soon as 2018 I believe the first real ramp up where global awareness will awaken will be at the end of 2018 when those harvests come in and the weather is so out of whack. If you really think the weather is strange right now with these, you know, blocking patterns that are locking heat in a place where the atmosphere is not moving, that's the reason this is happening. The atmosphere is not moving the way it should. This is based on cosmic rays based on the, the pressure from the solar wind, all these things that are happening right now magnetically and electrically on our planet, coupling with the sun, it's going to get worse because our sun is not at its low point in activity yet. We're only back into the 100 or 150 years repeating cycle, and we need to drop down to 400 years in the repeating cycle. We're not even halfway there yet in the intensity of the weather shifts. And we're not even at the bottom where it's really going to get intense, and it should stay intense for a couple of years. That'll be 2023, 20, 2024. We've seen nothing yet. We've really seen nothing. It's just the cusp of these changes, and that's why I'm so fervent about, you know, think, think outside the box. Okay, there's a lot of disused mines around the world, coal mines, whatever kind of mine it is. Line that thing with the LED lights. Throw in growing trays inside there. Get the vertical farming going. How many millions of miles of underground tunnel do we have that could be, you know, protected from these massive hailstorms, could be protected from out-of-season blizzards, could be protected from the UV, all controlled by our modern technology? You know, they didn't have that in the 1600s, what we have now. There's so many opportunities. In Venezuela, I'm going to say that that is a test case. Now, again, this is just my own opinion. I believe Venezuela is allowed to collapse on itself as a test case to see what's going to happen when it goes global. Okay. They're just testing to see what's going to happen down there. The food's run out. You see what happened with the currency. Everything's happening the same way it's going to be, but on a much, much larger, much more intense scale when it reaches that global level. But if I'm a scientist, I would like to look in sort of a Petri dish first to see what's going to happen. I agree. Venezuela is that, unfortunately, and I feel sorry for those people down there that are stuck in that predicament. None of their own doing either. Okay, well, I agree with you to a certain extent, but here's the thing. I've seen an interview uh, mentioned, oh, I didn't see the interview, but it was mentioned in the interview that Abby Martin from Russia Today, Abby's been on their show before, and I'd like to get her back on. And she quoted, she said she went down there to Venezuela to have a look at what they were saying. And she said there, there's lies in the papers. She said she went into shops and the actual... Um, um, the the, uh, the it was all stocked up. The shops, the shelves were stocked up with food. She said she doesn't know why they were saying it wasn't because she was down there and she seen it. So I'm not saying you're wrong because I seen the same information that you've seen, but she went down there to check it out. So maybe we need to get Abby Martin back on to find out and say Abby, what's really going on? Because again, you're dealing with the media. It's all scaremongering, you know, to frighten people as well and to to put it out there. So. If she went down there to check it out, then I'd like to speak to her. So we have to keep that in mind as well. But we have about um, we have about 10 minutes left, David. So what I'd like to do is, it's not all doom and gloom. Because the important thing here is, we have a fantastic opportunity now to start learning real skills. And hooking up with people, community, and like-minded people. And learning from each other on how to grow food. And set up bartering and time banking. And working with people. And myself, as I say, I'm not a gardener. I've no interest in gardening. But I like the idea of growing food. I just like the idea of pottering around and getting my hands in the soil. And uh, I'm learning as much as anybody. Now, lucky enough, I have um, uh, two people in my village who are in their 70s and who know all about this stuff. I mean, they really, they grew up um, doing this as young children on their uh, respective farms and lands. 
Um, so if I ever have a, qu- a question, I'll ask them and they tend to have the answer and know what to do, which is great. Um, but there are great, um, there's a, a, an Irish website out there called quickcrop.ie. I have no links to it. OIM have no links to it. But on quickcrops.ie, they actually show you videos how to grow and what to do. And you can buy seeds and all that from that website. And I like watching that because they've got good advice there as well. But what's your positives, David? Tell us uh, tell what you would recommend. <coughs> Well, let me put the timeline out so people can be aware of how fast this is going to happen. And thank you for the comments on Venezuela. You just strip back another layer of the onion, which will be the information war during this time. What is really true? Like, I haven't been to Venezuela, but what's going on down there? You say one person's visited, stocks are full in the stores, and then all these news reports and images coming off Zero Hedge, et cetera, showing all these people lining up around the block. Information war. So expect that during these times as well. But for those of you into numbers – We're repeating a 51-year cycle right now. There was two typhoons that just rolled over Taiwan, and this signals a 51-year repeat in time because the last time it happened was uh, 1967. Now, if we multiply five of these smaller cycles on top of 51 times five, you get up into 205. This is is close to John Casey's 206-year cycle that's coming up. And then... When you multiply five of these cycles of John Casey's 205, 206-year cycle, you get on top of an eddy cycle, which is approximately 1,025 years. And then with Maurice Cottrell's 3,740-year cycle, we start to get these sort of fractals of five going up, and they're repeating in intensity. So as basing off the mathematics of prior cycles that are more powerful laying on top of, think of these cycles as a wavelength. So the 51-year cycle is going to be something really, really fast, like going down. And the 206-year cycle is going to be something a bit slower. And then something around the 1,000-year cycle is going to undulate even in a slower, more wide pattern, if you will. The frequency is going to be much wider apart. But what all these cycles are overlaying on top of each other right now. So when we move from these, these next five months, you're going to see intensification in the weather. What you're seeing in these next five months, you're going to need to multiply by four going from 2018 through those 12 months into 2019. And then when we get into the year of 2019 into the year 2020, you're going to need to multiply by six compared to this next six months of change. Now, it's still unknown. Is it going to be a linear where we just count like this? Well, it happened this way in these last six months, so we just multiply by six. Or is it actually going to be an exponential on top of itself where these next four months are going to be much more intense than you need to multiply. So we're getting a 25 times or 24 times increase. Not sure. But anyway, look for these numbers. The next five months are going to be your indicator of how intense the weather will be. Your opportunity is finding what people will need during this time to survive and prosper. It's not about surviving. Don't think and limit yourself to just surviving. That Don't do that. You need to prosper and thrive during this time. And for you to short sell yourself, your mind creates reality. Cymatics proves that. When we think about all the traditions across this planet, your thought creates the reality. So do not limit yourself to just existing during this time. You should be thriving. You should be helping people. You should be at the center of the change. Because when we come out of this, it's going to be a new world. There's going to be a new economic system based on cryptocurrency. And I think during this change, when food gets really valuable, none of our letters of credit or traditional banking mechanisms will work. So we'll shift over to Smart contracts during that intermediary time. But when we emerge on this other side at 2030 or so, there's going to be several billion less people on this planet. But the opportunity is going through for a more sustainable life. And I, that's not going to stop when 2030 comes. It's going to become our new way of life. And just go into this trying to help others and trying to you know, make it the best you can and, and thrive during this time. And that's the best advice I can give is, It's going to be a mental game as much as it will be a physical game. Actually, it's probably going to be more of a mental game than physical because your body can keep going if your mind tells it to keep going. And once your mind stops, your body stops. Yeah. And again, you're going to have to help people. People are going to break down during these times. They're going to mentally want to stop. But it's your job also knowing that it's a cycle from the sun and it's not some like 
tribulation of something that you did, the, the earth did, the human species did something wrong and we're being punished for it. No, it's a cycle in the sun. It's a more powerful cycle, of course, this time around. But oh. thought creates reality and you need to help others going through this. And when it comes out and this is going to change, this is a reset button for society. And this is the reason governments have created global warming. They knew what the result would be of these cosmic ray increases and what would happen during this grand solar minimum. They made the excuse of global warming to explain it. They knew everybody on this planet would see changes coming right now or these last couple of years. What would you do? Well, 25 years in advance as a psyop or whatever you want to call it, you would start to program people so when they saw the changes, they would believe it was this. They would believe it was CO2. Because if you tell them truly that it's about cycles of the sun, they're going to lose hope. you got to keep them going. We can make changes. Well, now you have the real information. Instead of coming from fear, come at it from understanding. And this is the greatest thing I can leave with everybody is you're going to have to take care of people around you. You're going to have to organize yourself into smaller communities because these traditional just-in-time delivery systems and this getting your food from 1,200 miles away, that's going to cease. No bones about it. It's going to cease. And our economy is absolutely going to collapse. We're going to. Well, it's going to be a local. It's going to be too expensive. Yeah, it's going to. We'll have to go local. I'm just. uh, We have a question come in here. I want to try and fit in before we uh, we start wrapping things up. Um, The captain wants to know, can you ask him about the Moringa stuff? That makes sense. I'm sorry, could you say that again? I didn't hear that last part. Yeah, the captain wants to know, can you ask David about this Moringa stuff? Yeah, it's called Moringa oleifera. Okay. And it's called the tree of life, the superfood tree. It has the same nutrient content as spirulina algae, but it grows in arid environments or stressed soils. And how, how you grow this is, The more leaf that you trim off of it, which is your food source, and once you trim one branch, two come out. So you can do this during the growing season depending on where you live. If you live in Florida or you live somewhere in southern Spain or you live in Africa or you live somewhere where it's warm all year, you can continue. You can just use this as as an annual plant. It's a superfood. The leaves can be powdered. And then if they're vacuum packed, you can take that somewhere else and you can use it for a medicine and also for general nutrition. It's got the same content as spirulina, but it grows way faster. Now, if you allow these, after you trim it, the more you trim it, the more seed pods are going to come out after it flowers. Now, the seed pods have an oil in it that's as good as macadamia nut oil. So you could waste it for biodiesel. You could in a pinch. You really could. Or you can use it for cooking oils, which are going to be a little more scarce because, well, I don't know how many people know how to produce their own oils. But anyway, it's called Moringa oleifera, and it is called the miracle tree, the tree of life, a superfood tree. It's so easy to grow. You have no idea how easy it is to grow. You just need to line it up correctly, give it the correct spacing of about three feet, and keep trimming that thing. Don't be afraid to trim it. Trim it, trim it, trim it, because the more trim you get off of that, the more food source you get. And can we get over here in Ireland? It's too cold to grow there, unfortunately. Although, during the summer months, you could get a quick three-month crop, or if you had a greenhouse, you could continually grow it. It needs temperatures of about 18C and above. Probably 20C is even better, but it's got it thrives between like 20 and 35C. Yeah, see, it goes back to the whole idea of polytunnels and having a greenhouse, because if you have that, then you control the temperature, then you can actually do the growing And I think that's something that we have to consider as well. I mean, I have my raised beds outside at the moment, and they're open to the elements, um, which is fine because it's it's only cabbage and carrots and spring onion. But if you're trying to grow um, any kind of fruits, exotic fruits, you're going to need to have the uh, the greenhouse or the pony tunnels and be able to control the temperature. And then we get into the likes of solar panels and everything else that we'd have to get in. But David, we've reached that time. Um, again, a big thank you for uh, coming on the show. Um, much appreciated. Loads of information there. And uh, hopefully you now um, people will be able to go away and really have a think about, well, if this is coming down the road and it's going to be happening, then I really need to start looking at my self-sufficiency and not relying on the system. I think that's very important that we have to do that. 
David, do you want to, if, if you have any links or YouTube website or stuff like that where people can actually find you and look up your information, do you want to pass that down and uh, just say out there to the uh, listeners? I do, and thanks for asking. If you go to my website, oilseedcrops.org, that's O-I-L-S-E-E-D-C-R-O-P-S dot O-R-G, like oil and seeds, like seeds that you plant, and then crops, like crops that you harvest. There's a pop-up window that will pop up there, and if you enter your email, you can get a full rundown on all the slides I talked about tonight so you can take a look exactly in visual form what I spoke about Plus, I put a few notes in there and showed you uh, specifically the years of intensification. Also, ADAPT 2030 on YouTube. That's A-D-A-P-T 2030. And thank you for all my uh, subscribers out there. We're right up at 30,000 subscribers in the next day or so. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. Brilliant stuff. And uh, the, the podcast, Mini Ice Age Conversations on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and SoundCloud. Very good, very good. My son has just put up your link there on the chat room so people can track you down and find out all about you. David, it's been fantastic having you on. It's great information. It's very practical information. People need to get stuck in and just get back to nature and start learning how to do things. Um, And I hope to go down this road. Again, we might do a part two down the road. There's no reason why not. Maybe next year and we'll do a catch-up and we can review what we said this year for next year. It might be a good idea. But uh, stay with us now for a minute, David. We're just going to go up to a musical break, and we'll be back after this. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com and People'sInternetRadio.com. And we're back. Right, as, as I said, our guest is Barry Fitzgerald, and Barry's going to be um, at the BASIS conference, the seminar in September that we're going to be on and um, he's going to be doing a talk there. So we've asked Barry to come on just to give us a chat and tell us what he's going to be uh, covering there. Good evening, Barry. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Thanks for coming on, Barry. Do you want to, before we get into what you've been going to be talking on the BASIS conference, do you want to give us a bit of a background on uh, what what you're into? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Initially, I was was involved with, uh, with the whole shady area of the paranormal and and all the research and and that took me up to around 30 30 years of experience w- within that particular uh, field and uh, but i i subsequently grew from that um after finishing the uh, the show in, the, in 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 the US um back in 2011 and i started to work with uh, with uh, with a fellow irishman Cormac Strain down in County Carlo on a series of books called Legend Seekers, a series of stories. The stories themselves were designed to uh, to revitalise the, the the old myths and legends of Ireland, and some of them not so old. And uh, I, I have to say, what we were introduced to, we just simply weren't expecting, um, and uh, and and that brought us into into a new area. And that, of course, brought me um, kicking and screaming um, to to what I'm going to be talking about at uh, at the conference, which is the the Neolithic Irish, the spirituality, and and what they were actually doing within a lot of these uh, these ancient uh, passage chambers, and and how they were activating them, and uh, and more to the point, what was on the other side. Okay, so that sounds to me like a stargate. Um, I suppose you could call it call it what you want, um, but uh, th- there were there were there were definitely doorways to to other places, um, and uh, you know we we tend to find we tend to find what what just hid behind those particular doorways. We tend to find them right across the world. Um, I'm just back from from Peru. I was out there twice um, investigating um, the the mummies. Out there, the three fingered mummies, and uh, I, I just got back last week. And uh, again, you know, you, you tend to find a lot of 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 these traits and similarities within within mythology and folklore right across the world within different uh, cultures and faiths and everything else. Tell me something, Barry. How far back have you been looking? Because um, Andrew Powers did um, uh, a book um, and I'm trying to think of the name something got to do with uh, Ireland 
Hmm. It's the name's gone. If the listeners are there, and you sure. remember the name, a land of the pharaohs, wasn't it? Ireland, land of the pharaohs. Um, Andrew Powers. And there's a lot of talk about the Irish history. Uh, mm. Finn McCool, Two Day Donnan, um, yeah. and all these. Are you going back even before that? Oh, I'm way, way, way back before that. Um, and uh, you know, the the Two Day Donnan, I, I I see more as as the as the the, the bigger civilization. Um, and uh, they came from the east, but uh, for for me, it, it's the Neolithic period. I'm lo- I'm looking at at the structures which were built before the Great Pyramids of Giza, um, and uh, it's 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 what was happening then. And um, I, I got to say, the clues that they left behind, um, because a lot of the secrets were hidden in plain sight. And so uh, I, you know, we'll be looking at uh, at particular designs. Um, and uh, and how we see those applied within buildings today, um, and uh, and a lot of it is, uh, touches on ac- uh, acoustics, and, uh, and and some of the patterns that they left indicating particular frequencies. Right. Okay. And I've heard this before. We've had one or two guests on the show um, talking about this. And um, mm. what now? I'm just going to throw this out here because you're talking about. Things in Ireland and the history of Ireland, and what about the Ark of the Covenant? Um, we've been told that that is actually buried in the Hill of Tower. <laughs> well, I have, I have no idea about that. I got to say, um, but it, it is interesting to see that that the Neolithic um, people of of Ireland, our ancestors. Um, they were definitely utilizing magnetic anomalies, and we can track those magnetic anomalies with uh, satellite navigation or satellite um, technology today, modern age satellite technology. Mm. And uh, we we tend to find that a lot of these particular areas um, um, almost touch the, where where they tended to build their their important centers um, tended to be close or within these magnetic anomalies. And I got to say that the Hill of Tara is actually one of the biggest magnetic anomalies that we have on the island. Yeah. So there, is, there is some, there is, it was a a, a, a seat of power, um, and and of course we've got um, when we go back before the Druids and things, and that, that's where I tend to work. Uh, we find the, the Neolithic, um, and uh, and of course we've got the the great the great temples of North Dulth um, and Newgrange down there as well that we can't forget. Um, and these were way before the, the the Druids were coming along, or any any mention of the Ark of the Covenant or anything like that. Now, are you? I mean, I call them stargates. Mm. Now, if you were to speak to somebody like Miles Johnson, as you know, he's going to be involved in the conference. Yes. Um, he would say there are certain stargates around Ireland. Um, and personally, I would like to. If there is, I'd like to go and visit them sometime. You know, go on a kind of a road trip and yeah. che- and check them out. Um, now I know I remember Miles telling me of a location up north that yes. w- that was um, was p- particularly interesting to him, and he mm-hmm. said there were certain things going on at that location. Do you yes. know which one I'm talking about? I, I do indeed, and in fact, uh, we we covered that particular story. In uh, in Legend Seekers, the, the the first the first volume, and a, and a very intriguing intriguing site, and I, I got to say that that when we visited the site, um, to do a bit of of, of recce there, um, it, it it's it's a strange place, um, and uh, and it's it's a place that, it, it's a place that feels out of out of sync. It, it it's 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 not quite right, um. And when whenever we started doing our work, um, there we we were uh, we were doing our stuff, and and we we could see that that although it's called uh, St Patrick's Chair, you know this 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 particular place was used by by the Celtic people and no doubt the people before that. Um, but this was, you know, we often hear the stories of of St. Patrick coming to the island and and all those um, um, stories. And St. Patrick got around the island. My God, he got around the island better than I can with a car. <laughs> um, everything everything is named after him. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I got to say, this particular place, this 
is where the story originates, where St. Patrick run the serpents um, off the cliff, um, because it's within this forest that that happened. But that has more significance than what we, we would expect. Um, and uh, there there is something more to the story, which I will be discussing um, at the lecture, when when we, we start talking about uh, about the, the, the whole idea of Christianity coming to the island to get rid of the serpents of, of the island. Um, and, you know, when, when we go back and we look at it from a modern context, we say, what the hell were they doing? So there was no snakes here in Ireland. That necessarily wasn't the case. And that's something I'll be talking about um, during the lecture. Okay, so are we calling, are we, are we saying that we're talking physical snakes or metaphorical? Um, I believe there is a bit of both going on here. Um, so, I, again, you know, I, I don't want to give too much away before, yeah. before the lecture, but uh, it, it, it is exceptionally intriguing. And to see where that goes right up to the modern age um, is, is quite an eye-opener. Yeah, okay. Um, wow. Well, that's interesting because we, uh, you know, well, we never got rid of the snakes. They're all in the uh, the doll. As you know. <laughs> snakes and the rats. <laughs> yeah, we never go. They came back. They came back on, on the next boat that we sent them off to come back. <clears throat> yeah, the the interest now, is there anything that um, that we could tie into ley lines with the energy that you're dealing with? Is there any link up to that? No. No, what what I'm seeing is uh, is 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 purely magnetic anomalies, um, and, uh, and and as I say, within within the uh, within the modern age, we can track those. Um, it's very very easy to track those with the new satellite technology. Okay, so is this energy good, bad, indifferent? Um, well, actually, um, you raise you raise a good point because uh, the work that we were doing within the positive anomalies, the strong positive anomalies, you tend to find. Um, abduction. You tend to find um, um, mutilations. You tend to find uh, the UFOs, cryptids, um, and uh, and strange paranormal phenomena. Um, you tend to find these all amalgamated around this these positive anomalies. But interestingly, though, what we tended to find is that statistically, we tended to find um, more negative um, traits within within the negative anomaly. Um, such as uh, as a sacrifice, such as suicide. Actually, it's an interesting point that that within the top thirty suicide locations around the world, seventy percent of them appear in negative anomaly. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. And of course, I mean Ireland. You know, we know that we have a massive suicide rate at the moment with the way things are going at the moment. Yeah. I wonder, is, has, has anybody done any statistics regarding the amount of people around that location that may have committed suicide? Um, I don't know. Um, offhand myself, I don't know. We, we actually just stumbled across this, this research this year. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was something, as, as the song says, um, things that make you go, hmm. Mm, yeah, they're, as as Steve would say, and as Jim Mars said, who's passed on, you know, you put it in the hmm file, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we don't have an X file, we have a hmm file. <laughs> that, that we take out anything that we find interesting. So what else is is happening? Because the the amount of information we hear from people talking about the Irish history and things that went on, and how prevalent Ireland is to what's going on globally. We we have a massive, um, what would you say, um, and, and the Irish nation, the Irish people. Now, I think maybe what you're dealing with is maybe before the Irish people. I don't know who who was on the island. Who was on Ireland before the Irish people? Because we've been had so many people coming and going on the islands that you don't know who the natives are. Mm. Um, what? Who I mean? Do you have any information on that? Is there any historical information regarding bones or um, you know um, skeletons found um, as well, to the natives of Ireland at that time? From 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 um, our standpoint, I believe it was uh, maybe a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, that uh, one of the archaeologists here in Dublin, or sorry, Sligo, um, had discovered on on a rock um, some clues that had had shown that that habitation. Of the island was being pushed back, which which really had 
forced us to go back and rewrite um, our history books because it, it brought the habitation back on the island to, to um, 14,000 BC. Wow. Uh, of course, we were told that that, uh, that then um, we had the uh, the great ice packs above us and everything else, but obviously this wasn't the case. Um, and 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 the big the big thing is, of course, before the ice um, and, and and all of that, um, what was here before? Um, so th- those are the questions that that we don't know because the ice the ice destroyed and crushed everything, stone, bones, the whole lot. And um, so there's very little left. As far as as our human history goes, um, recent recent work has has been shown now down in uh, in oh my goodness um, just off the coast of, of Africa there that uh, that our habitation of the world has now been pushed back to three hundred thousand years. Um, so that that is a, it's a staggering staggering um, number to to realize and consider this that that the human race really has advanced within the last 150 years um what were we doing 300,000 years ago um and uh, you know we we've got we've got these stories of of something that has gone wrong and and I tend to see it in my work as well that around 2600 BC something something went wrong um, and uh, and we were we were knocked we we got the hell knocked out of us. Um, well, so, so something went wrong, and this was a global thing. Something went wrong around 2600 BC. Well, there's a number of um, ideas and suggestions as to you know what we were doing at 300,000 BC. I mean, it, it depends where you want to go with it, but people would argue the point that um, the Anunnaki there's always a mention of the Anunnaki somewhere down the line. And uh, they were around 250, 300,000 BC, if you want to go, go down that road. Now, mm. you know, when you get shown, uh, there, there are pictures I've seen of certain um, structures where mm. it looks like they are um, like pathways, like, like steps, massive steps, bigger than a human being, bigger than six foot. And mm. these are massive steps. And, of course, there's been skeletons found which are 9, 10, 20, 30 feet in height. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you go back and look at the book of Genesis, they talk about the Nephilim, and they were joints, uh, you know, and we, we hear stories of David and Goliath and all that kind of stuff. But when they start a- actually finding physical evidence of these skeletons being so big um, and certain things. Now, there's also talk about, and I don't know whether you know this, about these red-headed joints over in, near, no, it's not Bosnia, Kur- Kurdistan. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh-huh. I yes. mean, I mean, there's so much that we're not being told. Mm. Um, even now, I mean, again, if it doesn't go with the the the, the day-to-day dogma of what yeah. we're being told, it's hidden. And archaeologists are obviously funded by whoever, and they're told you tow the rope, and if you find anything that's got that goes against what we're told with their uh, modern-day dogma, we hide it, we put it away, and we get rid of it or whatever. Don't say mm. anything, or we'll pull your funding. Yeah, um, and yeah. that and that's the control system in place. That's that's pretty much it, you know. And th- that was <laughs> strangely, you should bring that up. That was something we were witnessing in, in Peru, um, with the with the find of the mummies there, um, and uh, there was definitely two camps that we were looking at. But uh, you know, th- there's a, there's always been stories of of giants and everything else, and there's always been stories of these giant bones being taken away and never to be seen again. Um, and certain big institutions in the U.S. being responsible for it. Now, whether that's true or not, I, I, I can't say. It, but we do have we do have um, a, a throwback um, gene within the uh, the border counties there in Tyrone that uh, that can that can bring giantism um, back into into uh, into the mix. And giants have been mentioned in, in Ireland as well. Um, and in fact, one one of our giants is in display in the uh, in, in in London in the in the, in the medical museum there, and uh, I believe he was over seven feet, um, and he was from Donegal. But uh, but we have, we have had them. We do have them in our gene. That every now and again, it throws itself back. Mm. Um, but uh, it it is strange that these giants do appear across across the planet. Definitely. And are there any other locations in Ireland that you would kind of you go, hmm, that's interesting. That's come up. Oh my God, yeah. Uh-huh. Especially with this, with this dealing of, of the uh, of the legends and, and, and myths getting back into them again, we uncovered these really wild places. 
And some of them we really shouldn't be at. Um, there, there was one we have, we have called the, the Island of the Dead, which is a place of oracle. Um, and this is really where I was, my paradigm was changed when I visited this place, um, which, which really steered me on to the path that I'm on now. Um, to look at this whole idea of what the Neolithic were doing and what they were communicating with. Another location that we were looking at was a, was an old um, mine that had been opened further down the country. Now, usually what we tended to do within the books is that we would supply um, the contact details of if, if you wish to, to uh, uh, visit the place yourself, we supply the contact details, the GPS coordinates um, and everything else so that, that any of our youth had the ability to go and, and, and experience this this part of our history as well. But uh, this was a place that we refused to put on our GPS or contact details because it was a place that was exceptionally dangerous. Um, and uh, and what was on the site had even murdered four four dogs, four German shepherds, um, and, uh, and interfered with elect- uh, electrics and everything else, had been responsible for clubbing one of the guys, one of the workers in the back of the head, who had fell, fall, uh, fallen forward while using the saw and took the fingers off him? Um, it was it was very very negative um, in its in, in its approach, and the place was shut down. Are you talking about an entity now? I'm talking about an entity. Yes. Okay. Something connected with our land. Okay. That's... So, something that our ancestors have been telling us about for thousands of years, but in the modern age, we'll go ah, I don't see it, so it's not real. That's actually quite a narrow view. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you, we're going to leave it there because we're running out of time, but that leaves it on a cliffhanger. And if people want to hear more from Barry, he's going to be at the uh, the Basis Conference in September, which I'll read out after the musical break. Barry, thanks a lot for coming on. That's a bit of a cliffhanger. That will get people interested. Fantastic stuff. Barry, before we go to musical break, where can people find you if you want to and track you down and find out, have a look at your website or wherever? What's the details? People will find me on Facebook, um, or they can find me at my website, which is charmstealer.com. And uh, that's charmstealer.com. Brilliant stuff. Barry, just stay with us there. We're just going to go off to a musical break, and we'll be back after this. Great. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com and peoplesinternetradio.com. And we're back, and that was a a song by a chap called Tony. Um, He lives in Plymouth, Devon in the UK, and he's an unsigned musician. And he sent in uh, the song to us. The song is called It's Not About You. And it's uh, six minutes long. It's quite long as a song. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't play the whole lot. But we heard the song, and we, we thought, isn't that a lovely song with the vocals and everything else? It's just really, really nice. So um, Tony's on the chat room at the moment there, um, under Tony T. So you can uh, you can say, speak to him there if you're on the chat room there. You can you can say hello to Tony. And we just thought it was a lovely song, and uh, we said we'd uh, give it a spin on the air on OAM, and uh, we'll put that on the actual set list here, and we put it in the queue, and we'll be playing that. Normally, what we do is we play music before the show starts at seven o'clock. We have a range of music. And what we do is we put a lot of songs in the queue there. So we'll, we'll add that to the queue now. And uh, Tony will be able to tune in um, before the show and listen to the music and hear a song come up there on the set list. Um, really nice uh, song there. Well done, Tony. Now, that was uh, Barry Fitzgerald. And he's talking about ancient Ireland. And that was quite interesting uh, regarding what he said um, about that entity and he, he, we were just talking to him there during the musical break and he said there's other locations in Ireland that are the same thing and it is a, a negative energy or entity that's causing that so if you do want to know more about that information obviously the basis conference is where to go now obviously a few days before that on the 13th and 14th Kerry Casty and Maria Wheatley are going to be doing an ancient tour uh, ancient site tour two days before the basis conference so if you want to find out more about that go over to projectcamelaportal.com slash events and you'll be able to find out about that ancient site tour but the ireland awakens conference in conjunction with miles johnson basis project taking place at the talbot hotel still organ on the weekend of friday and saturday sunday 15 16 17 of september 
A three-day event will comprise of 16 national and international speakers covering a wide range of subjects from UFOs, alien abductions, controlled remote viewing, secret sites, the elite mind control, ritual child abuse and many more. One of the main reasons for the conference is to get up uh, to the minute new information from an Irish perspective out in the public domain. I'm also very excited that we... Uh, that as well as Miles Johnson speaking here in Ireland for the first time in many years, Kerry Casty from Project Camelot will be given presentations about Saturday and Sunday. Now, I have to say, with all the speakers that we've had on, given kind of teasers of what they're going to be talking about in the basic conference, it's going to be a phenomenal conference. The information is going to be brilliant. Um, now, we are going to invite the guests on the show. We will do full shows with them. Um, but we won't do it till after the conference because obviously a lot of things they they would talk on the show about they would talk at, at the conference and for the people who can't get to the conference then we can get them on the show and we can talk to them about that so um, that's going to be you know um, as I say it's going to be an interesting conference lots of information and of course we're going to be there as well um, so there's the news now next week on OAM we're going to have Thomas Williams uh, back on from the Truth Honor and, and, and Integrity Show. Um, and we're going to be talking about the top 10 conspiracies that are out there. Everything from Planet X to Flat Earth to Yellowstone and everything else. And we're going to get Thomas's take on that. And um, just to see what he uh, his opinion is and what his intel is regarding it. Because he has good intel regarding these um, conspiracies. And maybe they're just there to send us down the rabbit hole. And just to keep us busy. Um, and they're not real at all. So we'll find out from Thomas anyway. And again, a reminder for people, um, as you know, Jim Mars passed over during the week. Um, Jim's been on the show. His YouTube video or the podcast that we did with Jim are on the YouTube channel. So if you want to hear them, you just pop off to our YouTube channel and you'll be able to find them there. And that's really uh, the news, um, as I say, um, for this week. Steve's down in um, down the country at the barbecue uh, having a break off. So it's just myself. I'd like to have uh, say a big thank you to my son. My son was on the chat room there. I think he did a sterling job. Thanks for everybody in the chat room for behaving yourself there. Um, but uh, very happy with the work he did. Uh, put the questions up and everything else. It did a fantastic job. So thanks for that, son. Um, so if Steve's not here again, we'll get you on again. But for myself, Alan James and my son, take care of yourself. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>